chimed in. Svetlana, um, how many people do we have registered for the workshop this morning? Uh, you know what, we had registered over 60. Right now there are 41 that signed in. Great. Excellent. So Good morning, everybody. And welcome to our webinar. I would like to introduce you to Lara and from Carden Consulting, and they will do a webinar today on establishing the strategic direction for First Nation development corporations and good corporate governance. So welcome, everybody, and enjoy the webinar. Yes. Thank you so much. Hi, Scott. Um, and uh, uh, we'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional territory that we're coming from you live from, and that's uh, the territories of the Slavotov, uh, Squamish, and Musqueam peoples. We'd uh, like to thank them for being able to do this uh, work on their territory. Uh, my name is Kunko Yes from the Yakchanas Clan of the Haida Nation. Hadala Isis Aklins Akte Gudne Lagan. That means uh, good people. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm a member of the Haida Nation from the Aklanas clan, uh, Old Masset and Haida Gwai. And uh, we've been doing this work for almost a quarter of a century. I have been, um, and Mark has joined, um, and we've been doing this work together for a few years. Uh, my background is uh, 25 years in business and economic development with more and more specialization in indigenous governance uh, policy development and get indigenous governance planning. So we have a, a good amount of experience. What we're gonna share with you today is our understandings and our learnings because every time we do the sacred work for our communities to help build their capacity for future generations, we always do a search of um, uh, indigenous research, academic research, uh, what we're seeing as best practices in the world and in Canada. And so we have a bit of information we'd like to share with you to help support your good work. And I'm Mark Salter. Born raised Victoria, Vancouver Island, amongst the Lekwungen people, and I was a Lekwungen greeting, uh, welcoming all you honored uh, guests to our studio today on the North Shore of Burrard Inlet uh, in the Slayatot Territory. Um, Larry makes a 25 year reference, uh, but I did work, the first time I did work in community was 25 years ago, I believe, just doing the math a little bit, uh, working with the uh, uh, offices of the Six Nations in Oshwikin in Ontario, working as in, from the insurance perspective, I was in the insurance group. And we brought uh, new, bills, new business opportunities to the nation through an insurance uh, reinsurance program so that workers could be covered as they worked outside the reserve. So it was a really important piece of work for them. And I'm really proud to be part of that. That started my career, I guess, without even knowing that Larry was doing the same thing on the other side of the continent. So good morning. Um, and we have Justin in our small studio here. And uh, he can maybe just say a little wave. He's from the Haida Nation as well. And um, he's going to be able to do a little bit of uh, um, work as we go. He's going to be moderating the chat room. So we have a very interactive workshop and process and style uh, because your knowledge and your wisdom is really important to share as well. Again, we've learned this from working with our nations. Um, your experience and your sharing of best practices helps everyone here as well. So. Um, thank you everyone for being here and please feel free to jump into the chat room, share your lessons and learning, ask questions. This is meant to be an, um, a learning experience, not only from us, but with each other. So with a circle of um, practice of economic development uh, officers and economic development leaders, we'd really like to be able to hear your story as well. So we're going to get started with taking a look at some of those, again, key pieces that we've learned that have made a difference in terms of establishing economic development corporations for First Nations in, um, in the territories that we serve, primarily BC, but also uh, we've done quite a bit of, I've done quite a bit of work across Canada as well. Um, so today we're going to take a look at, um, again, uh, we just wanted to see if there's anyone that would be willing to, before we start off, and this is always our little reminder prompt on the PowerPoint, to be able to share an opening prayer for us. Um, is anyone willing to step out and, and help us out with that? Okay. Here's so Mike, um, I, I just do a quick one that I learned working with Ovid Mekrity years ago. Um, and his was always, and I, I really like this one, creator help guides are thought words and actions to serve the best interests of your people today and future generations. Thank you. So today we're going to go over in 45 minutes um, or so. And if we get a lot of activity, which we normally do in terms of questions and interaction, that might spill over and more so be focused on an interactive workshop 
and then questions and answers will lead, try and leave as much time as we can at the end. What we want to talk about is the uh, standard approach for establishing development corporations, the importance of values, principles, and the purpose of an organization that's community owned, that's intended to support economic development in a community. How important performance measures are and those limits by which we say what is not permissible, allowing us to unleash um, those experts that are in our community. Um, how to establish competency matrix to uh, ensure that you have the best people on your board of directors. Shareholders and board members roles and responsibilities. The importance of corporate governance policies to be able to ensure good governance for your development corporations. And of course, those types of agreements that help support ongoing capable governing institutions within your nation that can create economic development opportunities. And then I'll do a quick closing and just see how the workshop was for you. So again, we've done the territorial acknowledgement. You do see our email on there after the workshop. Please feel free to email us or um, contact us directly. We're happy to help in any way we can. Um, we do a lot of uh, volunteer work and pro bono work and other work as well to be able to help support our nation. So we, we have the honor of doing that and please feel free to contact us. So we'll start with the failed premise. The a, a, a failed premise. And our remote control is giving us a little bit of a challenge. It's this it new, thinks it's Friday. It's, it's interacting with the with the screen differently. We that sort of we'll switch to the to mouse. Yes, mouse. Okay. Uh, good old fashioned remotes, and we're going to switch to a mouse. All right, here we go. The failed premise: the vast majority of lawyers who have hired to assist with setting up development corporations and indigenous communities have little experience working with our First Peoples. From the growing number of First Nations lawyers and, and lawyers with a deep understanding of First Nations in Canada, few have experience in setting up development corporations. This comes from personal experience. We know and this. in that we do have a lot of lawyers setting up development corporations, but they use the Canadian model for doing so. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So they do have um, sometimes experience, but they use the wrong approach. So and that's what we spoke to her on an off the shelf incorporation with a standard incorporation establishes board accountability for shareholders and as a result does not establish accountability to the citizens of your community. As a community owned community or development corporation in consideration of the multiple needs and potential benefits to your residents and members and citizens of your community, future generations, a tailored approach is needed for planning and legally incorporating and establishing agreements that benefit your community. In this workshop, we'll share some of the key considerations that we walk leaders through to help establish development corporations that are accountable and operate in accordance with the characteristics and character and values of your of good corporate governance. So we, uh, again, I've been doing this for um, development corporations and helping to establish those in community economic development planning for quite some time. And um, that is the failed premise. We, we operate assuming that a colonial model or a Western model of a community owned development corporation is going to meet the needs of our communities. And when we take a look at the model, the model is wrong. So we're trying to fit a um, square peg into a round hole and it's not working. So that's the failed premise we talk about. These things should be developed and included in articles of incorporation or a business charter, corporate governance policies and community economic development planning and agreements for accountable community owned development corporations include. So these are things you want to see in a property setup dev corp. So in um, my experience, when we've come in to try and remedy situations in the communities where a development corporation has gone off track, where it's starting to do what it's not intended to do, we start to peel back the layers and we find out these simple things have not been established in the formation of the development corporation. So when we take a look at, and I remember hearing years ago from someone who was a development officer, business development officer um, in INAC, who used to work with communities, he always said, business is business is business. No, it's not. Because First Nations businesses, when we take a look at our development corporations, must be founded on our First Nations values. And having said that, there are pieces that are missing, particularly, again, as a community-owned development corporation, the foundation of which must be built on our own Indigenous values, which are different than the mainstream. So as a value set, we have collectivist values and Euro-Western um, models uh, Gert Holstead, who's a Dutch researcher, has clarified and made this very, very um, understandable for academic researchers that the Western world has individualistic values. So our value set is different, which means we behave differently as an organization as well. 
So those things have to be spelled out, as well as the principles, what can't be allowed, um, the mandate, what is the purpose, so form follows function, what is the purpose of this development corporation, and of course the mission. Performance measures and limits, those always have to be included, and those have to be defined by senior leadership or the shareholders to say, this is what we want to get out of a development corporation, not just money. And when that focuses, this narrows only money, we see again, organizations going divergent. A competency matrix to ensure that the board is uh, suitable for that nation, not just whoever is uh, a representative from council or a representative from families, people with the skills to make this organization work. And we've heard this a few times, but we're going to go over that again. Shareholders, members, roles and responsibilities, there's always a lack of clarity on that. So shareholders quite often, we're dealing with the community right now where there, um, there's a lot of unawareness around their rights as shareholders to say, the board's going rogue and this is not what this development corporation was meant to do. You're fired. We're going to recall that board and you're going to have to come back to square one and start over again. So there are authorities by which the shareholders can say, you are not filling, fulfilling the purpose of this organization. So we wanna make sure that shareholders know that as shareholders and trust for your community, you do have rights to be able to make sure this is done the right way. Um, corporate governance policies, which we'll go over. Um, community advisory. So one of these things that we always find, and it's across the board, it doesn't matter if it's um, First Nations housing, um, it doesn't matter if it's a development corporation, um, the nation, it's really important as collectivist based values people that we have shared decision making processes. And in this case, we've seen over and over again, not only in research, but in practice, that people who are involved as community advisory are supported to improve their capacity, build awareness, support the development corporations work, share opportunities, build small business development, which creates a diversified and vibrant economy not just by the development corporation. And of course, um, the most important thing creates that capacity for future generations. And of course, finally, the agreements that quite often are missing between a development corporation and the nation where the development corporation, again, just starts doing its thing and, and doesn't have its responsibility fully outlined or fully realized back to the nation. Establishing and reestablishing strategic direction of the First Nations Community Owned Development Corporation, the inclusion into the Articles of Incorporation. So, when we take a look at establishing or reestablishing a development corporation, some of the main things to be able to get it, the foundation built properly or to be reestablished, the most important ones are the Articles of Incorporation. Most lawyers, and I've dealt with quite a few, will not do this. They just take an off the shelf model and they go, it'll work, it's fine, and it doesn't. And then they go ahead and say, we're gonna, um, we're gonna have this uh, work in this way. But what we find is that, um, again, those values have to be laid out first and foremost. So when we take a look at values, those are the, uh, and this comes from a bit of um, the specific additional research I've done. When I did my master's degree, I did some specialization in values, including most importantly, um, values research from the Value Center, the International Value Center in London and um, Europe. And I did a level one and level two uh, cultural certification, which means and takes a look at um, organizations like Google and IBM and um, all these large organizations that are doing quite well. And they're doing this work that is considered the 21st century way of leading. And that's taking a look at the values of the people that you serve. And if your values are aligned with that, what happens is that, again, our First Nations values unique and need to be represented as the foundation is that we see revenue grows four times faster. Rates of job creation grow seven times faster. Stock prices grow 12 times faster and profit performance 750% faster. We've got a little footnote next to there. So if you ever wanted to find out, that is um, very specific research that's been around for a few years that proves this that values can help change the dynamic of an organization to operate incredibly effectively because it, again, unleashes and revitalizes everyone to understand their purpose and to be able to be working in, um, as we always say in our canoe analogy, to be um, paddling in the same direction at the same speed and with the same purpose. 
So it's really important that we consider values in the formation of our development corporation or the redefining um, of our development corporations. Um, one of the big examples I'm just thinking about too is that what you can see sometimes is uh, a very experienced CEO or senior manager hired for a development corporation and they're told create profits. We need money from this machine, whatever it's going to be. And the definition of profits without the informed understanding of what that means in terms of benefits and wealth creation that the nation needs, or if it's not defined by leaders, can mean that someone can come in and say, okay, I'm gonna make as much money as I can at the expense of the nation, as opposed to for the benefit of the nation, creating broader wealth outcomes. So when we take a look at values, it's really important to think about what are those things most important to you and your people prior, current, and what needs to be considered in the future. And defining and spelling those out and... And in your own language, if at all possible, because it's those value statements that come within the language of your community that bind your members together. And the words that you use in your own language that represent your values are ones that most of your community members will be able to adhere to and understand and ultimately rise up to the expectations of. So really important that values that there's alignment the community's values and the corporation's values and the people leading the corporation. Everyone has to be on the same, in the same canoe, and all paddling in the same direction. Um, there's going to be some course corrections, as we all know in our journey, but we all have the same vision and mission, and we're getting and we're working together to get there. That's the most important part. So when we take a look at values, the screen didn't show it properly in the display, but values inform our behavior. So how we're taught about values comes from us when we're babies in the womb from in the womb to um, the grave we keep hearing elders talk about learning all the time and as we learn when we're younger what happens is we um, understand and we start to get painted this picture of the world that we internalize that says these are the most important things in the world to us as a people that comes from your immediate family and extends out to the extended family and the community as a whole and we start to understand our place in the world with these things prioritized. And those values are something we just know. Um, we know what feels right, and we know what's important for us. And those are things like respect, interconnection with the land, all of those things. So when those values are expressed, they inform how we behave. And similarly, again, our organizations behave the same way. So when we take a look at principles, those are the things that are the rights and wrongs. What's the things that's our filter of what's a right behavior and a wrong behavior. Those are our principles. So, and we get a lot of consultants and it's sometimes hard to differentiate between values and principles or, or uh, values in a mission statement and vision statement. But values, again, are simply the things that are most important to you and they're anything you define them as. So when we take a look at some of the ones that are consistent, and we see a lot of those things um, that we've seen over time with our communities is accountability. First and foremost, good governance rests on the whole foundation of accountability. That includes and most importantly means that you document what you've heard, either as a CCP or a Community Economic Development Plan, and that you use that as the basis for your plan and your strategy to be able to move forward. And then you report back on those same things. So you wanted a um, gas station um, uh, developed in this corner of the, uh, la our lands. So you go through the process of developing it. And every time you go back to community, you report back to say, this is where we're at on that. And that simple accountability is something that's very frequently lost and forgotten about, and it has to be done. And it can't be apples to oranges. Uh, you, we have a CCP or we have a community economic development plan. Oh, that's nice and lovely, but we're gonna go this way. No, 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 it can't happen that way. It has to be based on the needs of community for them to be engaged and empowered to be able to do other things as well, including small business development. Um, and accountability speaks to issues regarding listening to what's being said as well. So it goes a two-way piece. People got to have that. You got to share that information to the community, but you've also got to open those ears up and listen to back what the community has to say to make sure that you are aligned with what they believe is their goals and understand the objectives of the mission of the business. Uh, use words such as purpose or intent to focus attention in this statement as the principal controlling idea for a development corporation. What's the goal here. The focus of a development corporation is being established what are the intended outcomes. For many of our First Nations clients, they've stated this includes limited to creating consistent, sustainable financial benefits that 
ensure the development of corporation sustainability and reinvestment back to the nation. Skills and training and employment, contract opportunities within the nation, for the nation's citizens. So the ability to get employed, learn how to be a, a small business operator and move forward. That's part of the mandate. Sustainable development, management and protection of the territory. So don't you know, build something and destroy the things around your community that, that sustain you. Developing hard infrastructure, so roads and soft infrastructure like broadband. So there's important pieces that a, that a development corporation could bring to the community. Bring a road in, bring in the power, bring on the internet. And then ultimately being aware that cultural revitalization is a part of the goal here and looking to ways to bring culture and language into the operations of the development corporation. If that is an expression of your community, it shouldn't be less expressive of who you are as you go and do business. And we see that all the time. And a lot of people will say, okay, well, we're building a hotel. Oh, great. Yes, that's good. Or we're building a dam. We have an agreement for uh, benefits from a dam. How can we incorporate culture? Well, all I have to do is take a look at some of the major developments that are happening, like a casino just south of us, uh, like the 2010 Olympics along the Sea to Sky Highway that has nothing but First Nations language all the way. And the cement bridges have First Nations design created into the molds that they did for the bridges. So there are opportunities at every single point to revitalize culture. And these broad um, scope of opportunities that should be uh, arising from a development corporation, these are examples that we've seen over and over again from the development corporations. And when we ask them, what is this uh, development corporation meant to do? We usually go, well, money and jobs and I don't know. So we're sharing this with you because this is what we found at the end of the day, after a lot of planning over and over again, we see the same things that can help inform your planning as well. So other pieces include the protection of intellectual property, which means that establishing and helping support those types of policies or laws in your community, make sure that you can take a look at um, particularly for tourism based communities. So we had the opportunity to work with the Musqueam nation up to the 2010 Olympics and the conversation with the Musqueam is, we're going to be welcoming the world. What do we want to share and what do we want to keep protected? And so when you're developing tourism strategies, you don't want to release areas and information for sacred sites and have those destroyed. You want to have plans and thoughts around how those things are protected, including official marks for your nation, including copyright for some of the information, including territorial protections and zoning and signage to make sure that those areas are protected. So all of those can be a part of the behavior and the work of the development corporation. And of course, building citizens capacity so that as those opportunities roll out, you have agreements, whether the uh, impact benefit agreement or a, um, any other form of agreement that you have coming up, whether it's a joint venture or other, that you have funds in there to be able to build broad understandings from citizens in the community to know what's going on. That means training, talking, planning, um, formal and informal um, different ways of doing this. And again, most importantly, as Mark said earlier, small business development. This is real passion for me. Um, I did uh, a lot of small business development for the first several years that I was doing this type of work at, and interestingly enough with Can Do as well. And um, what we found is that in a, uh, one of the only ones for many years, a small business study in BC for Aboriginal people that I did, um, that we have less than 10% small business represented in our communities. And yet in the mainstream in Canada and BC and each of the territories, it's all the same. 98% of our economy is based on small business and business enterprise. And yet we ignore that and try and create these big, huge, um, uh, malls and think that that's going to be the only thing we need for uh, development in our communities. And really what we have to invest our, our time and energies into is the supporting people. the capacity of the people to understand business in terms of how it applies for them and to be able to get the best benefits out of the development corporation as well. Well, you can see from this perspective, creating a mandate and a purpose for your development corporation, the work has to start early. The consultations have to be begun soon because these are the values and hopes and desires of your community members being expressed in this business enterprise. Things like getting in traditional knowledge protected and deciding what to share and not to share will take a little bit of time to sort out. So this is a fundamental part of getting the foundation of your enterprise doing what you want as a community. So it's really important to do the groundwork to get 
get to it early. So those um, uh, outcomes that we hope to see, uh, we'll talk about in a minute to also become your performance measures. So that's how the community or the development corporation should report back to the community. So when we take a look at the purpose or the intent of the development corporation, sometimes it can be a purpose statement from leadership. Sometimes it can be a vision statement created with shareholders, the board and community. And any event, the purpose of a development corporation needs to be made clear. And so when we take a look at that, it's taking a look at most importantly, what are the outcomes that we just referred to? What are the things you want to see coming out of it? Um, so when we think about it in its broadest form, what we've experienced is the last slide that there's this broad understanding of things we want to see increased. When you take a, a look at, um, for example, one of the ones that we heard and we love the most is wealth creation. And this comes from, I think it was originally yeah. member two who started to define that and we saw it back east. Mm -hmm. And this idea of wealth being much more than just money. Um, it means uh, uh, health, uh, ability to have a balanced life, um, social connections, a healthy society, civic engagement environmental quality, personal security, cultural well-being, and subjective well-being. I feel good about my community. I feel good about where we're at, those types of things. In addition to those material things that we see, income, wealth more broadly in that sense, employment, earnings, and housing, and sustainability of well-being over the long term, so natural capital, uh, economic capital, human capital, and social capital. And this definition comes from the United Nations in terms of wealth creation and wealth um, more broadly in terms of Indigenous people around the world and the kinds of outcomes they're striving for in other parts of the world for Indigenous people. So it's a really great example to think about. Um, again, referring to the primary method, um, what are the things that are going to be happening? What are the things that that development corporation is expected to do? Business development, yes, and diversify the economic economy so that you have that type of resiliency in your community, not putting all your eggs in one basket for a mall or a, a um, gravel. Uh, traction. Yeah, so taking a look at making sure that you have a number of different things to be able to develop and rely upon. Yeah, diverse economic development is important because as the economy shifts and the world moves through post and pre-pandemic, having all your eggs in one basket has never been a good plan. Uh, refer to constituents who are intended to benefit current and future generations. You really got to get engaged around um, making sure that um, who is going to benefit from this and really be clear about what the goals are for your, for your members and your constituents in your community. So a purpose statement has to refer back to who's going to benefit, like a vision statement. Who's this for? I did the entire purpose statement in your own language with an English translation follow. However, if it's in English, we do encourage you to use your own language and provide general working definitions really important because if you're now a development corporation you're doing business with other business entities and they see your culture as they in, entertain you as they get your emails from you they visit your website they know who you are and they know where your values are based upon they're coming from your community you're going to find people attracted to that particular uniqueness and that's people you want to work with and we have uh, just some comments back. Uh, I just want to, we don't want to forget. We have a, a shout out from none of it. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got quite a bit of work happening in the chat room. Justin's just sharing that. Someone said that those types of purpose statements need to be shared consistently. Exactly. I totally agree. Um, what we recommend quite often for our communities is to put that vision and mission statement up along with your values in your boardroom. So every single time you sit down, and you're going to do your work, you know exactly why, and you're reminded on a regular basis. It's like Coca-Cola, marketing to ourselves, that like constant awareness helps us to do our best work. Um, I don't think I like the Coca-Cola reference, but it's... <laughs> um, so again, one of the things we wanted to talk about, similar to what you want to see come out of a development corporation, those are your performance measures, and that's what we've seen work really well. Regardless of that, performance measures are a critical tool for leaders to be able to develop and make sure that... Um, they can strategically monitor the performance of the organization. But these must be developed in a very meaningful way, not only from senior leadership, but also included legally, because it's quite often the case where we've seen development corporations go sideways, is they'll create this purpose statement, create all these great works, but they don't document them and build them into the DNA of the development corporation. So when it comes down to it, the development corporation is going to always revert 
to back what it's legally required to do in the Articles of Incorporation or legal agreements. And if they don't have that, they won't adhere to it. So when people worry about and we come in to help fix these things, it's usually because they're not even formalized. They have these great works, this great idea of what this is supposed to do. And then as it evolves, it starts to, come, to totally lose its purpose. And so it's really important to formalize these and build them into the DNA of your development corporation in the Articles of Incorporation. That goes back to that taking the time to set the foundation and get the canoe ready to get going on its journey. So you do all the things and protocols you do for prepping your canoe. That's where the work is. Once you're in the water, moving forward, the work should already been done. You shouldn't be fixing the canoe as we go along. And don't accept when a lawyer says, oh no, we don't need to do that. Oh, we can talk about it later. Uh-uh. They're happened. not gonna be the ones holding the bag at the end of the day. In five years when you're, the development corporation's gone rogue and you have no, nothing to show for your community, you have to include it and you're in charge of that lawyer. They're not, you're not employ, being employed by them. So you're employing these people to do the best work for you. Make sure it's written in and built into the DNA of your development corporations. Performance measures. Good performance measures are a tool that's used to demonstrate progress. Good performance measures are not subjective. They typically focus on a clear objective measures, explicitly defines who benefits, units of measure, collection frequency, data quality, expected outcomes and targets, and are ver verifiable. They're exact, either the number of things, percentage of things, or the value of things. Those that are not effective for First Nation governments are outcomes focused on inputs, process outcomes, and project-based measures. So what measures matters. You find something you can agree on that you're going to achieve. It's either going to be um, more volume, more graduates, better health, better health outcomes for your community. Those are values you can put numbers to and you can begin to track. Performance measure allow measurements of accomplishments, not just of the work, what is performed, but the focus is employees' attention on what matters most to success. Support transparency and accountability and good governance through mitigating micromanaging. Everyone knows the goal. Everyone's working towards that location. So everyone's achieving it together. Every measure part of a chain of cause and effect I must link to the realization of the objective. As such, it's important to critically reflect and agree upon what measures will be to ensure that the outcome is consistent with the intent. So we have Vicki Scully sharing that uh, with regards to the posting the values that the Assiniboy Credit Union in Winnipeg has a plaque displayed in um, their offices that posts what the vision is that they're working towards. And again, that constant awareness of where are you heading helps everybody to do this their best work. Thank you so much for sharing that example, Vicki. Um, so when we take a look at performance measures, again, um, we did, did give you some examples that we've seen over and over again, and hopefully they'll help inform your discussions as you go through your planning or realignment of your development corporation. And just a quick sidebar, good governance and good corporate governance are the same thing. They have the same parameters and character and um, behaviors and characteristics that we see displayed in um, an organization. And we did do a workshop on that last week, but if you have questions about that, please let us know. Uh, so when we talk about performance measures and control, what we can see sometimes is shareholders or the board having great levels of authority and to do their best work and maintain their strategic focus to be um, the leaders that are intended to be for those organizations. The easiest way to do it is to use those performance measures. So if we're gonna talk about establishing a business and for example, it's a grocery store and you have a return on investment, you have a number of people trained and employed, you have small business suppliers, you have a number of things you can measure. Those are the things that you wanna be able to focus and have your conversations always around. In addition to it, like our last week's session, the, the laws or the or agreements, the um, policies and procedures by which your organization operates are the strategic level conversations of leadership. And the ones as they relate to operations are always best focused on performance. How are we doing with our return on investment? How are we doing with the number of people that have been employed and trained? How are we doing with subcontracts of our uh, um, members who are um, providing services for us? How are we doing all of these areas? Talk about constantly how you're doing on those performance measures that you've agreed to, not subjective things that make an organization unstable, um, not safe, uh, not performing well. Performance measures allow you to have a degree of control 
through reins that allow you to say, this is the direction we're going and we're going to maintain that control on the performance. Um, and in terms of the canoe, I, I like the example Mark can, can share with you. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, well, when we're, when we're putting in the, the canoe journey, we're looking to reach an objective. We do know that we'll have course corrections to make and we'll have inputs to come from the bow and the stern. We'll tell everyone on the vessel what we're going to be doing differently to get us to that location. And that's our checkpoint. We are going to a community up the coast, but we know there are several capes and points of land we have to traverse. So we'll know that we're on our track and we're on our goal if we're at that location by a certain time of the day. And everyone's working together to achieve that, knowing that's what our goals are. So inputs from the bow and the stern are important to keep the vessel on track and intended outcomes are achieved despite the wind and the tide. And it's always important because you hear those people at the bow of the boat saying, yes, head that way, uh, steer right. You know, they'll talk about paddling harder on one side to make sure they're always reiterating, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? And that allows everyone to focus their energies to be most effective in getting there. So leaders at the end of the day, this slide is intended to show that leaders have a great deal of ability to influence an organization and can extend their reach into micromanaging too easily. And the focus on performance measures allows leaders to control everything it must, not everything it can. And the focus is not on how it'll be achieved for leaders, it's what is to be achieved. And that constant strategic conversation allows for the best work from everybody. We'll get back to the canoe. We can't have the leadership or the stern step into the middle of the canoe and begin to paddle and help out there. There's a reliance on that portion of the canoe holding its own, doing what's expected of it, achieving the stroke rate that's important to achieve the goal. So important to know your place and to empower the people who you rely upon to get you there to do the work they can. And so this slide is intended to reiterate that a bit. So you, you do your strategic planning, whether it's a community economic development plan or if it's based on the CCP. Oh, sorry, Brenda, yes. Um, you're asking a question right now. I wanna stop there and just let everybody know right now, you will get a copy of this presentation in PDF form from Spitlana after the presentation. So don't worry about writing notes down, you'll get all of that. Sorry, we forgot to mention that in the morning. Um, so when we take a look at our plans for our development corporations, it's really important to state our goals, objectives, tasks, how we're gonna measure if we know we're successful, the deadline dates, responsibility centers, and then of course the reporting that comes from it. And that circle that's blue is in intended to display in a visual way how leaders can control an organization to make sure you get your best from it. And that's focusing on the performance measures that are reflected, collaboratively developed, and then reflected as measures in your reporting. And that informs the course corrections, as uh, Mark was saying, on the performance measures that need to happen. If we didn't get 10% return on investment this year, how come? Oh, it's 7% uh, because we had this happen. Okay, how can we uh, correct our course and go from here as a learning organization? That's the conversation that's strategic and most helpful for a development corporation to realize its goals. And Lara slipped that in there just slightly uh, under her breath. Learning corporation, which means adaptive, which is the resilience of a community that's, that you have already today. Your communities have shown resilience and ingenuity and creativity. And that's an important component to keep going because that's something you never want to forget about. Great. Um, and just so you know, we've got some more comments about the PDF and some of this information for yourselves after. Uh, Terry's asking if there's going to be a recording available. We do have this actual recording on the Kandu uh, website already for our last workshop we did in July. I think we're going to be doing the same thing with this one, but you can watch the one from July and it's quite, it's, it's, we've got a lot of good feedback from the people who have watched it. Angela, um, just acknowledging thanks for the PDF after the fact. It's helpful. Um, and we are recording this one. I'm just being advised from Justin. So some of the performance measure examples, again, are the really important ones to think about in terms of how you report out. So when we take a look at that whole scope of things that we talked about, what are the intended outcomes of development corporation? What is the performance we want to see realized? For example, uh, financial return on investment, training, um, uh, land-based net gains, uh, infrastructure hard and soft, cultural revitalization, intellectual property protection, and building citizens' capacity. Those things are what are set out. This is what you have to do. Now you report back. What you're going to be reporting back in your annual reports and your quarterly reports are those same things. Apples to apples, not apples to oranges. So it's what did we realize in terms of reinvestment to the nation? 
at the end of the day, how much money did we make net? What, where our money spent? Financial transparency is really important for a development corporation also. And also at the end of the day, how was that money reinvested into the nation for programs and services? And we do always try and recommend staying away from distributions because we see programs and services having great benefits while distributions can enhance um, social. social issues that are negative to a community. Um, so the real easy, simple examples of measures are number of citizens trained and employed and retained and transitioning into management, number of citizens contracted and provided small business training and support, adherence to the land use plan and protection of the territory and net gains, depending on how far you want to go into that land use plan and the land code, uh, sustainable resource management outcomes, for example, those net land benefits for zoned areas of development, um, and silvery benefits of infrastructure legacies, so infrastructure hard and soft. So if you have a call center coming in, they better bring broadband into the community so that students in our world today, for example, are, might be having challenges with broadband and connecting to their schools to do their school work, now have benefit of that as well. And of course, ancillary benefits that support cultural revitalization. Now we'll have to look at the board's development and making sure they meet your needs as well. And just while we're waiting for that to go forward, we always do put as much information as we can to share as much as we can so we can help support our communities to develop. Um, we're happy the PDF's going out, the recording's going out. This is really meant to be a resource, so don't think you have to remember everything. You are internalizing it when you need it. You remember there's something else you need to think about, but this is meant to be a resource for the future as well. So when you get to those points, it's a touchstone for you. So keep it like a workbook or a reference guide in the future. So the First Nations Development Court board competency matrix the people you want to have leading your board of directors and helping make decisions uh, the matrix is a, a list of broad characters of a team that are intended to guide recruitment that supports the development core organization to realize its purpose you've gone to work about the purpose you've now got that finished now you want to find a board of directors that will support that purpose and move you forward typically this includes a holistic set of skills the team should possess including financial management skills experience and or training in your particular industry that you're working in. Uh, corporate law skills, experience and or training. Again, some of those in that field of work. Business skills, experience and training around having run a small business or a big business, but the idea of having the process figured out. First Nations understandings and First Nations development corporate experience. So that's an important component as well. Should they, they work successfully with other communities? Have they realized the community's goals and outcomes? Those are important. And specifically, uh, good corporate governance as it relates to First Nations community-owned development corporations. Business experiences as it relates to First Nation, uh, to the nation's industry is a priority. So nations influenced heavily by tourism industry should have a tourism expert on their board. Conversely, if it's any other resource, same idea. And you could also have your formal board, if it's a smaller community or smaller board, you can have an advisory board made up of experts from exterior to the community that don't have voting, but are able to be uh, senior leaders in their field that contribute to that kind of good work. And people who are really successful like to do that. We do, we always run into really successful people who like to give back. Leaderships in establishing and reestablishing the financial First Nations Dev Corps should define exactly what the matrix is, it should look like for their nation. So the leadership has to come together and put this together to meet the needs of your community. Processes in the board recruited is ideally through a board call. However, First Nation representatives are preferred process you still try to ensure that those on the board with whom the appoint authority have the skills needed to realize the purpose and the benefit of the current and future generations of your community. So a lot of communities that we go to appoint community representatives and that's wonderful to see but this is not a social exercise this is not a social we're not expecting to get money out of it it's expected to make money this is built for this purpose so it means you need people who have that type of expertise to be able to guide it. So even if you do appointments, make sure you go through some sort of filtering as well to make sure they have some experience to be able to do this. We've got a little bit of feedback from Vicki. Infrastructure legacies are great. Community doc um, also measured by this use of small business tourism and citizens, for example, fisheries as well. An advisory committee is key as time and legal responsibilities are high for a board. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that that's working for you as well, Vicki. So we spoke about this piece a little bit earlier as well, the differing responsibilities of the shareholders and the board. 
And what we always want to be able to reiterate with our communities is that the shareholders do have a very active role acting in trust for a community. And again, these things should be spelt out in a, um, uh, the Articles of Incorporation um, and also realize uh, that those types of things need to be set out in different forms of legal structures, as we all know, and that everyone's, we see all on, over and over again, our best practices and legal structures being heard around the world for us. So GP, LPs, we know those subsidiary models work, um, having those percentage uh, flow throughs of 99 and 1% to minimize tax is all something we're seeing many, many First Nations do. So we're starting to see that. Another myth we wanna be able to make sure is that in looking at those uh, shareholders' roles and responsibilities, one of the things in working with um, Stephen Cornell, Dr. Stephen Cornell from the Harvard um, Nation Building Research, as well as the uh, University of Arizona um, uh, Indigenous Economic Development Program, is that he regretted having this misinterpretation go through. And that is that business should be separated from economic development. And it's not true. They has to have an effective working relationship, not a separation. So they have to be legally separate entities for tax purposes. You can't have the entire council on the board because if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, CRO will say it's a duck. So it means that um, if you have your assets being controlled by the same people, they're going to consider those assets of the nation and the liabilities associated. So what we want to do is separate those leaderships, but the accountability still has to be there. And this is a part of it. So shareholders have the responsibility to set the strategic direction of the development corporation through expanded legal documents. For example, articles of incorporation, or if you can't get to that point, include it in your shareholders agreement, or if you have already gone down that far down the road, a business charter, somehow a legally binding agreement that can set the direction of the development corporation, which includes what we said earlier, values, principles, purpose of the DC, scope, limits, all of those things, board selection and criteria. And of course, most importantly, monitoring the board for compliance. That means, as we said in that performance measure, the shareholders and community should get regular reporting. I don't mean once a year. We always recommend once every quarter. Once a year is too far apart. The pace of our lives and change is happening too fast. And in CCPs, we don't say five or 10 year plans. And Community economic development plans, we don't say five or 10 years, we say three to five, maximum five. When we take a look at reporting, quarterly, annual is not enough. Um, you know, this, this page is set up for shareholders on the left, board responsibilities on the right. Really important that shareholders know their responsibilities and their obligations to, and, and be shown what they're expected of them. And that's important because those shareholders through your leadership will then influence how the board selected and ultimately how the development corporation reaches the goals of your community. Um, I just want to read yeah. some of the feedback we've gotten. Kathleen Lungard says that they've had some challenges getting youth involved in governance and with an aging population that you're seeing that leadership potential um, having some challenges. Uh, work with your what we always recommend because having youth involved because they naturally age and they don't become youth, they don't stay youth all the time, is to work with your schools to develop leadership development programs so that you have a rotation and establish systems by which you support that so that as youth age, they can still be a part of it and you can hear what's needed from the youth's perspective and you develop that leadership over time through sustainable systems. Another one is Arthur Mitchell. Have any development corporations experienced community pressure to op operate social enterprises as opposed to strictly economic enterprises? That is businesses that may struggle to show a profit. We do see that a lot and please jump in and let Arthur know if you have any experiences too. What we always say for our um, leaders is if it's a social enterprise and never meant to make money, make sure you set up that legal structure under the nation. That is something that makes a lot of sense to align. Now you've got training and education and um, all sorts of syn synergies that can be created as a part of it. So keep that under your nation's hat as a legal structure. When we take a look at when it's meant to make business, put those under the development corporation, but keep those ones who are not meant to make money under the ownership of the band with its proper legal structure so that those synergies can happen and you're not harnessing and restricting the uh, performance of the development corporation. But again, we're going back to those basics. Build it the way you want it from the beginning. Make sure it meets and exceeds your goals and expectations, reflects your community's values and work towards all aspects to achieve that really important. 
Now back to the board's responsibilities, establishing a mission statement consistent with the mandate set by the shareholders. So you, you have done their work, they've got to reflect that back in their job. Establishing good corporate governance, policies and practices, including direction reporting requirements that align with those set by the shareholders. And if the shareholders want to have it every two months to be updated, that'll be one of the walking papers that the board will have to work with. Hiring and managing the senior manager is the responsibility of the board. And so therefore, they'll have good direction to hiring the right person because they've heard what the community wants. Monitor operational performance through the CEO, develop and adhere to operations policies, corporate economic plan, performance measures, and reporting. So it keeps that circle going. So your community economic development plan should again be the, the primary foundation of information that you build your plan and your performance on. So when we take a look at good corporate governance, um, I'll, I'll go through this really quickly timeline wise because you will get a copy of this. What we generally say is that those nations, including member two, who was some of the initial ones that sit this out in terms of their own performance success, is that when you establish repeatable processes in terms of policies, you're able to get better performance. So making sure you have your policies internalized and adhered to so that you can continually improve and improve the outcomes of the uh, development corporation. This is a copy of the Indigenous Governance Policy Model. Suffice it to say, anywhere a leader could and should influence the development corporation, there should be a policy for it. So a relationship amongst themselves, to the senior manager, to shareholders and citizens, and of course, how they go about planning and reporting, a really key piece again. And again, we talked quickly about the advisory committee. So really, really important to have some representation. And I'm just looking at the time. We've had a little bit of feedback, which is fantastic. And I'm just monitoring that as well um, to make sure that it's understood that you have a formalized community advisory committee in terms of reference. Youth representation on this one is fantastic. If you have a youth agreement um, with your school board for their graduation and volunteer hours, that's a fantastic way to establish that as well making sure that you have, again, that as a piece and formalized as much as possible. It's really important as an advisory, not a decision-making group. Um, additional typical agreements that we see that are really important for development corporations are those loan repayments. What monies are going into establishing the development corporation or expanding it? And what agreements are legally structured for that to be recognized and repaid in the future? Sometimes it's a one-way journey that these types of things get invested but really the intent, again, as Mark was saying, if the intent is for those monies to be repaid, get it in writing. It's always more important to get it in writing and never have to use it than to have um, a hope that'll happen and then have to go back and have some legal issues and have some conflict that's divisive, not only for your development corporation, but for the community. Reinvestment agreements. How are monies and profits going to be reinvested? A real clear capacity building effort to understand what your cash flow looks like what your reserve funds are for, um, your contingency funds are, or your reserve funds are for any kind of business or reinvestment into um, the development corporation's assets, your LPs. And then on top of that, the net profits. So where are those going to flow from? Um, from the development corporation to the nation, how does an agreement capture that in a clear definitive way and for it to be supported regularly? Finally, um, it's important to where if you have a shareholder who's on council, make sure those people are really clear on when they're wearing what hat because that's where we see a lot of confusion we'll see leaders go in and say uh, you know i just want to do this or do that and they can't it's outside of the scope of their uh, responsibilities as a leader or as a shareholder so you can't have people bouncing back and forth on hats and it creates a lot of confusion so we have a comment from jenny Gioki, jock what are good ways to communicate reinvestment in many different forms as dividends reinvestment as community infrastructure and services? So what we always say is to be able to have some kind of legal agreement with leadership and with community. How would you like these funds, funds to flow through? Really trying to focus and support capacity building that investment into programs and services that they may need are more important than any kind of distribution because the, the outcomes are much better. But to communicate reinvestment is uh, critical through community engagement, through a very open dialogue with the support of um, ways and methods to formula formalize this, including legal if you need to. Uh, we have a comment from Greg Booth underscoring the debate between social enterprise and economic development or metrics to determine the values of the corporation as being realized. Yes, 
a more rigorous explanation of understanding the symmetrics allows the ability to address various needs and values and the ability to reach to address for each unique venture. Yes. So really, really important to be clear on the purpose, as Mark was saying, of that enterprise. It's like having... A... Well, I'll give you an example. If you're going to build a canoe to go up the West Coast, you build it to do the waters you're working in. If you're halfway through and you're, you find yourself in another body of water, you've built the wrong canoe. You have to know what you want. You can't build it on the way. You've got to get it built right and build it with your inputs from your community. You seek to a master carver to get your canoe built. Those are the experts you go to to, to realize the goals and needs of your community and what you want. And if what you're getting in the way of advice from professionals is not meeting your community's needs, get better advice. So we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, we see there's a few chats going back and forth. Um, do we have any specific questions we'd like to be able to address or talk about? We've had a number of great examples and sharing along the way um, that aligns with a lot of what we've experienced and shared today. Do we have any other questions or anything that we've missed that you would like to know more about? And just for anyone who hasn't worked a lot with First Nations, we do this pregnant pause, the um, counter, the cadence with which we speak um, in a lot of First Nations communities is much slower. So for those who work just in the corporate world or in, um, uh, in the mainstream, what uh, a good lesson is to just let that pregnant pause hang. So um, I'll do this. Albert uh, Drapeau has asked, also, if a member of a council from a First Nation government is on the DevCorp board, there was a liability issue that could open the line to lawsuits directly to the First Nation. That was the message we in the Yukon received from our uh, YFN lawyers and advisors. Yes, thank you, Albert. And that is something that's really, really important to understand, that there has to be uh, control around the Development Corporation's leadership, because again, if, the, if you have those same people controlling the assets of the Development Corporation and the nation, CRA will assume it's the same thing and you end up having legal liability and potential risk to the nation's own assets for elders care, daycare, all those things become at risk. So it's really important to separate. But could we not have a place where if it's a five person board, there could be leadership as one of those positions on the board. It's about the dominant flow of the board of directors. It's not the leadership of the nation, it's the board of directors. It's a member of the leadership of the nation on the board of directors, totally different kind of a scenario. So Vicky was asking how to align responsibilities between staff developing CED plans and DevCore strap plans. So um, we don't consider them separate. Oh, um, ideally, <laughs> ideally, what we try to do is build off of um, community CCPs. And we are saying um, generally from there, that's where you take your major influences. A DevCore strap plan should be taking that core information around what communities' needs and interests are but also talking about some of the more operational things that help build the organizational capacity and or opportunities of the development corporation. So those fundamentals need to be added to the strat plan, but also if you do your job well in community economic development engagement, you build the capacity and awareness and members will tell you, yes, you have to get a good board. Yes, you have to make sure that you have your financial um, management policies. Yes, you have to have human resource policies. When you talk about what things are generally needed and best practices, you'll find that members capacity can be really supported by making sure that you both work together to develop that strategic plan, CCP based. Wants and needs of the community members are reflected in that, in that process and therefore easy to build on and, and have people join you in the success of where you're going because they've committed to it by saying that's what they want and now you're going to show them that's what you're doing and they can be involved in the process going forward. So um, we had some great opportunity to share with you. We really appreciate those people who are able to share. Really fun to know we had people from all across Canada and including, yes. including many of it. That's so cool. <laughs> um, uh, we'd like to ask if anyone could help us out with a closing prayer um, and we will be available in the email. You see our email and contact information. Please let us know if we can help serve your community in any way or answer questions or provide tools or resources. We're here to serve you. And of course, there's a chat question you have. We'll, open, we'll leave the lines open for a few minutes after the broadcast so that we can take those. We'll turn the mics off for here and we'll uh, wait for any comes from you. Do we have any volunteers for a closing prayer? <laughs> I'm listening. We can just hear the sound of the rain on our roof here is all we can hear right now. 
So um, in the interest of time, it doesn't look like we have anyone right at the moment. So um, just a quick closing prayer. Thank you, Creator, for bringing us together, keeping our people safe. Uh, hope that we can, this information could be shared and supported through those open hearts and open minds that were here today to help build the um, capacity of our communities for current and future generations. Stay safe and hope everyone is well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara and Mark, uh, for this informative workshop. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. I will send a copy of the PowerPoint presentation later today. And have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.